what Jesus said about lust that many people do not know. Explaining this subject involves addressing two complex puzzles. Let's break them down into simpler terms and discuss how they relate. Puzzle 1. The Eyes That See Lust You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Matthew 5, 27 and 28 Jesus said this statement and it has challenged people for centuries. The Mosaic Law explicitly forbade adultery. Someone could boast about never having broken this commandment, but still have impure thoughts. Even if they appeared respectable on the outside, their mind might constantly wander into impure labyrinths. Jesus reminded his disciples that simply avoiding the physical act of adultery was not sufficient. Instead, inner purity was necessary. While the law prohibited the act of adultery, Jesus went further, forbidding the desire itself. He said that anyone who looks at a woman with the intention to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If you think or act adultery, do not satisfy the sex urge. You pour oil on a fire to quench it. Sin begins in the mind, and if we nurture it, we eventually act on it. We have an explanation of the seventh commandment given to us by the same hand that made the law, which makes it the best interpreter of it. The seventh commandment lays a restraint upon sinful appetites. Both sinful passions and appetites should always be under the governance of reason and conscience. If indulged, they are equally harmful. The passage teaches us about the existence of heart adultery, which refers to adulterous thoughts and attitudes that do not necessarily lead to the act of adultery or fornication. The text suggests that the impurity caused by such thoughts is not only included in the seventh commandment, but was also indicated in many of the ceremonial pollutions under the law, for which people were required to wash their clothes and bathe their flesh in water. This passage prohibits not only the acts of fornication and adultery, but also any desires or lustful thoughts towards them. Such desires are the first step towards committing the sin, and if they are dwelled upon and approved, it is as if the sin has already been committed in the heart. The only thing lacking is the opportunity to commit the sin itself. It is said that the mind is debauched, and the eye is often the gateway to such wickedness, as seen in the stories of Joseph's mistress, Samson, and David. We read, The eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. 2 Peter 2.14, New American Standard Bible Having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having hearts trained in greed, accursed children, why do we need to make a covenant with our eyes, like Job, agreeing to only gaze upon the beauty of the natural world and works of God, without allowing any impure thoughts or desires to take hold? We must make this agreement with ourselves, and if we fail, we must take responsibility and make penitential amends. Job 31.1 I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I look at a virgin? Why do we cover our eyes? It's to prevent corrupt gazes and to avoid their contaminating effects. This also prohibits the use of any of our senses to incite lust. If tempting glances are forbidden fruit, then even more so are impure conversations and lewd behavior, which only serve to fuel the flames of this infernal passion. Some people argue that it's impossible to follow the prohibition against adultery of the heart. They say that it's difficult to resist the pleasure of looking at a beautiful woman and refraining from lusting after her. However, such arguments should not be accepted and must be countered with the fear of God. Jesus also spoke about the power of temptations. Now, if your right eye is causing you to sin, tear it out and throw it away from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand is causing you to sin, cut it off and throw it away from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body 
than for your whole body to go into hell. Matthew 5, 29 and 30. It is not inappropriate for a minister of the gospel to preach about hell and damnation. In fact, they must do it because even Christ himself preached about it. We are not fulfilling our duty if we fail to warn people about the punishment that awaits them. There are some sins, especially fleshly lusts, that we need to be saved from with fear. These sins are like natural brute beasts that cannot be restrained unless they're frightened. We cannot keep ourselves away from sin, just like Adam and Eve could not stay away from the forbidden tree, unless we have a deterrent like the cherubim with a flaming sword. When we feel tempted to indulge in our base desires and refuse to deny ourselves, we must consider how much harder it will be to suffer eternal torment in the lake of fire and brimstone. Those who are unaware or disbelieve the severity of hell would rather risk their eternal ruin in those flames than deny their unwholesome and brutish lusts. Hell will bring torments to every part of the body, making it crucial that we take care of our bodies and possess them with sanctification and honor rather than giving in to the lusts of impurity. Even those duties that are most unpleasant to our flesh and blood are profitable to us, and our master requires nothing from us, but what he knows is for our own advantage. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Here, Jesus uses a figure of speech and did not speak literally. Mutilation will not serve the purpose. It may prevent the outward act, but it will not extinguish desire. Bruce. Jesus emphasized the idea that obedience requires sacrifice. If we allow sin to control a part of our lives, we need to understand why it's better for that part to die than for our entire lives to be judged guilty. Sadly, many people are hesitant to do this, so they either continue living in sin or never come to know Jesus. They never move beyond wishing to be better. No wonder Paul exhorts believers to flee from sexual immorality. Jesus' most famous message, the Sermon on the Mount, focused on the hearts of his listeners. He targeted his disciples as the audience and proceeded to preach what we now call the Beatitudes. He called his men to be different, to see the world from God's perspective, to relate to people in a supernatural fashion. To maintain one's sexual purity requires more than simply abstaining from engaging in lustful activity. It's also something that involves the heart. But Jesus said that looking at a woman lustfully is to commit adultery with her, in your heart. Immoral actions then begin with immoral thoughts, and the immoral thoughts are evil too. You can't address sin by only dealing with external actions. Lust is a vivid illustration of the kind of sin that Jesus urged his followers to avoid and in today's culture, it presents a significant obstacle to the pursuit of moral purity. Jesus desires for his disciples to have such a profound commitment to moral purity that they are ready to cut off anything in their lives that tempts them to sin. He's not calling for physical mutilation. Again, sin is a matter of the heart and not merely the eyes and hands. Instead, he's calling for a radical approach to avoiding sin. It is also important to distinguish between temptation to sin and sin itself. The look is supposed to be not casual but persistent, the desire not involuntary or momentary, but cherished with longing. Jesus, despite the fact that he was tempted in every way, withstood these temptations but did not give in to such sin. Hebrews 4.15 For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things just as we are, yet without sin. He was able to see women as more than just things for his sexual fulfillment. Puzzle 2. What Jesus said about the one that causes lust and Jezebel. Jesus also warns the one that causes others to sin. Matthew 18.6, New American Standard Bible. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it is better for him that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and that he be drowned in the depths of the sea. 
Jesus emphasized the idea that obedience requires sacrifice. If we allow sin to control a part of our lives, we need to understand why it's better for that part to die than for our entire lives to be judged guilty. Sadly, many people are hesitant to do this, so they either continue living in sin or never come to know Jesus. They never move beyond wishing to be better. Jesus motivates his followers to take care of other humble disciples. He also cautions anyone who tries to take advantage of them that the disciples will have the power, protection, and strength of the kingdom to support them as they serve their master. Although Jesus uses the term child as a metaphor for discipleship, he later refers to little ones who believe, but the meaning is the same. Jesus stresses the gravity of leading someone astray from the path of discipleship. The phrase, cause to sin, does not refer to a single, isolated mistake. Rather, it suggests that someone has been led astray and has fallen into sin, causing a disruption in their relationship with God. Engaging in behavior that habitually leads humble followers of Jesus into sin is an indication that one is on a path towards eternal damnation. It would be better to quickly change course than to risk continuing down that path. Warning about allowing one's own passions to lead oneself into sin. Matthew 18, 8 and 9 And if your hand or your foot is causing you to sin, cut it off and throw it away from you. It is better for you to enter life maimed or without a foot than to have two hands and two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye is causing you to sin, tear it out and throw it away from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fiery hell. Jesus is now speaking to the disciples directly regarding their personal responsibility for their actions. He wants to make it clear that they can't solely blame others for their sinful behavior. Jesus emphasizes that they must take ownership of their own tendencies to cause themselves to sin. Jesus used hyperbole to demonstrate that allowing one's passions to lead to sin is a grave mistake, far worse than cutting off a body part. He wasn't suggesting self-mutilation, but rather emphasizing the level of self-discipline needed for committed discipleship. One's actions reflect the state of their hearts, and consistently giving in to sin is a sign that one is not a true disciple of Jesus. Those who continue in sin will be condemned to eternal punishment in Gehenna, a place of fiery torment according to God's judgment. Jesus addresses the lustful Jezebel. We may have heard about Jezebel in the Bible, an evil queen that murdered God's prophets and promoted the worship of foreign idols like Baal. However, we may not be aware of a special Jezebel and her spirit and influence mentioned by Jesus in the book of Revelation. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Revelation 2.20, New American Standard Bible. Although it often describes itself as a prophecy, Revelation is actually in the form of a letter. However, instead of one church, this letter is addressed to seven. While it has a unique message for each, it's evident that everyone should hear all the letters. In Revelation 2, a character referred to as Jezebel is mentioned in one of these letters. This occurs during the Lord's warning to the seven churches. A woman referred to as Jezebel was present in the Thyatira, the adulterous church. Thyatira was the most minor and least important of the seven cities Jesus addresses in Revelations 2 and 3. Jesus observed many positive things in the church at Thyatira, but there were also many significant problems. The issues were significant enough for Jesus to declare nevertheless, which can be interpreted as, despite all the good, I have a few things against you. A woman whom Jesus called Jezebel was at the heart of the scandal that engulfed the church at Thyatira. This may not have been her literal name, but a title that unmistakably denoted a self-styled prophetess inside the church 
following in the footsteps of Jezebel as described in the Old Testament. The name Jezebel had a powerful connotation. When we refer to someone as a Judas, we imply something strong. It was also a strong thing to call this woman Jezebel. She was one of the most criminal figures in the Old Testament, and she strove to blend the worship of Israel with the worship of the idol Baal. An unnamed prophetess in Isaiah 8, 1 through 4 bore Isaiah's son, Maher Shalal Quashbaz, whose name was prophetic. Jezebel was not like these women. We read the activities of this Jezebel, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Jesus identified the precise transgression that was committed by this woman and called her Jezebel. She mostly influenced others in an immoral and sinful manner, and as a result, she brought other people into sin. Jezebel led others into immorality. Sin begins in the mind, and if we continue to feed that sinful thought, we will eventually act on it. We have come across the proverb that states, Whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus adds that it is possible to commit adultery or murder in our hearts or minds and that this is likewise a form of sin and is prohibited by the commandment against adultery. Jesus traced the roots of sexual desire back to the eyes when he said things like, whoever looks at a woman. This is true according to biblical statements and life experience. Job 31.1, Amplified Bible. I have made a covenant agreement with my eyes. How then could I gaze lustfully at a virgin? It is also important to distinguish between temptation to sin and sin itself. The look is supposed to be not casual but persistent, the desire not involuntary or momentary, but cherished with longing. Jesus, despite the fact that he was tempted in every way, withstood these temptations but did not give in to such sin. How we conduct ourselves in the struggle against sin. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Here, Jesus uses a figure of speech and did not speak literally. Jezebel encourages sexual immorality. Jezebel encourages sexual immorality, while Paul encourages believers to flee from sexual immorality. He's not calling for physical mutilation. Again, sin is a matter of the heart and not merely the eyes and hands. Instead, he's calling for a radical approach to avoiding sin. The Word of God speaks to the depths of our sensual desire. The truth of God's unwavering standard of holiness calls our moral failings into question. The Bible contains words of wisdom and instruction that encourage us to trust God for liberation from worldly desire. Flee Immorality 1 Corinthians 6, 12, and 13. Everything is permissible for me, but not all things are beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything and brought under its power, allowing it to control me. Food is for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will do away with both of them. The body is not intended for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body to save, sanctify, and raise it again because of the sacrifice of the cross. Paul says, Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. This means that the human stomach has been so constructed that it can receive and digest foods. And yet, we should not live for food because they are only of temporary value. They should not be given an undue place in the believer's life. Don't live as if the most significant thing in life is to gratify your appetites. Temptation operates like rocks in a harbor. When the tide is low, 
everybody sees the risk and evades it. However, Satan's strategy in temptation is to raise the tide and to cover the dangers of temptation. Then he likes to bash you upon the concealed rocks. This Jezebel led others to sin. Is God more displeased when you cause another person to sin than when you sin yourself? Or are all sins the same? This issue arises when we think of a verse like Matthew 18, 6. Jesus said, Is there a greater punishment for someone encouraging and leading others to sin? Answering a question like this is tricky, since it depends on what we mean by worse. Worse in what way? If we commit sin and don't repent, we will suffer the second death. If we commit sin and don't repent, we will suffer the second death the lake of fire. If we cause others to sin and we don't repent, we will suffer the second death, the lake of fire. We could say then that neither is worse than the other, for in both cases the end result is hell. Sin is sin, and sin leads to judgment. So in one sense, no sin is worse than another, if we think in terms of our final destination, whether we go to heaven or hell. Yet some sins are worse in terms of their consequences, at least in this life. Worst of the bad. Referring back to Matthew 18, 6, it is clear that causing a child who has faith in Jesus to turn away from him is deserving of severe punishment. The term fall away in this context refers to abandoning the faith and committing apostasy, which ultimately leads to destruction. Both the one who falls away and also the one who causes the falling away will end up in hell. But surely, the one who incites another to sin bears a heavier responsibility, which explains why a millstone should be tied around his neck. During Jesus' trial, Pilate inquired about his place of origin. However, when Jesus did not answer, Pilate became furious, John 19, 9 and 10. Jesus reminded Pilate that his authority was from God, but the one who handed him over to Pilate had committed a greater sin. It's unclear who Jesus was referring to. Could it be Annas, Caiaphas, or even Judas? However, for the purpose of this text, it doesn't matter. What matters is that Jesus believed that the person who handed him over was more guilty than Pilate. Same judgment, different levels. We also read, My Servants. This demonstrates how serious of a sin Jezebel committed. She tainted Jesus' servants. How can I avoid enabling someone else's sin? Enabling sin means giving someone the confidence and power to continue sinning or making it easier for them to do so. When we strive to be righteous, we need to be careful not to punish other people's sins. Relationships between humans can be complicated, and there are many situations where we might get involuntarily involved in someone else's sin. Friends and family are the avenues that Satan often uses to entice us to participate in sin we would otherwise avoid. 1 Corinthians 15.33 Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Do not make friends with a person given to anger or go with a hot-tempered person. Proverbs 22:24. However, no one has the power to make another person sin. Sin is a condition of the heart. Matthew 15, 18 and 19. But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and those things defile the person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, acts of adultery, other immoral sexual acts, thefts, false testimonies, and slanderous statements. And we are each responsible for the choices we make and the condition of our own hearts. It is crucial to set healthy boundaries for ourselves to live a victorious life, which is what Jesus wants for us. This Jezebel's action affected the unity of the church. Revelation 2, 21 through 24. I gave her time to repent and she does not want to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with plague, 
and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. We then read, And I gave her time to repent, and she did not repent. The most serious charge that Jesus brought against this Jezebel was that she did not change her ways. These statements allow us to see both the mercy and the judgment that come from our Lord. Having time to repent demonstrates mercy, and she did not repent. Although God allows people time to repent, that time is not infinitely long. This teaches us that whenever God grants us the opportunity to repent, we ought to make the most of that window of opportunity. Repentance has always been the first step toward entering the kingdom, but what does repentance entail? There are two words that are believed to be the same as repentance, but are not. The first is regret. Many people have regrets about how they have lived their lives. I'd be astonished if anyone listening didn't have regrets about any of their life decisions because regrets are feelings about what you've done to yourself, what you've done with your own life and your own decisions. The second word is what we call remorse, which is how you feel about what you've done to others. That, however, is not repentance. Repentance has this unique feature. Repentance is what you feel you have done to God. That's a big difference between regret and remorse. Suddenly, you understand it's God who has been the most hurt, just as the prodigal son realized it wasn't just his father who had been hurt. Luke 15, 21, the son declared, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Repentance in the New Testament is divided into three stages, thought, word, and deed. I'm going to show you that repentance is always repentance of particular sins. You can't repent of general sins. This entails the following three phases, thought, word, and deed. It entails, first and foremost, changing your perspective about certain issues and thinking in God's manner about them. And you come to two conclusions as a result of this. First, God is far better than I had imagined. And second, I am a far worse person than I had imagined. In the world today, it's usually the opposite. The second step is the word of repentance, and that means first to confess sins. In the New Testament, there is no confession of general sin. There are only numerous confessions of sins that are plural. If you're bitter, it's because you've decided to resent rather than forgive what has been done to you. Mankind's most fundamental need is repentance, as it allows for God's forgiveness. By acknowledging the role of our choices in shaping our character, we can take responsibility for who we are. But this Jezebel refuses to repent. It's possible that Jezebel didn't have a particularly significant following, in the same way that a small amount of leaven may impact an entire ball of dough, a small number of people who engage in immorality and idolatry can taint the entire church, particularly if they wield influence over others in the same manner that Jezebel did. This Jezebel offers things that make godly men weak. Two habits that keep godly men weak. Number one, defiling habits. If we stumble or fail, it doesn't mean our adversary is stronger, but rather that our strength is limited, as the Word of God explains. Proverbs 24.10 If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. It's important to note that the verse mentioned is not talking about our physical strength, but rather the state of our inner selves, also known as our spirit. There are certain symptoms that can help us determine our spiritual condition and assess our level of inner strength. The devil will constantly try to affect our spirit by bombarding us with negative images, words, and memories. In Jeremiah 32:34, the Lord is angry with Israel because 
They set up their vile images in the house that bears my name and defiled it. Bringing idols into the Lord's temple was an act of defilement. Sexual sin of any kind defiles a person as well. This spirit also encourages a lack of spiritual discipline. When we are totally empty of anything that is spiritual or spirit-filled, we automatically become empty. This then makes us vulnerable to spiritual attacks that intend to make our spirit man fail woefully. The Threat of Discipline When the prophetess declined to repent, Christ warned of his judgment. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed. Whether taken proverbially or literally, those words are forewarning. God is holy, and he will not tolerate rebellion indefinitely. As Hebrews 10.31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. What Jesus wants the church at Thyatira to do with this Jezebel. Revelation 2.22-25 Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with plague, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold firmly until I come. We read, I will cast her into a sickbed. Before instructing the Christians in Thyatira on what they must do, he first told them what he would do. Jesus first shared with them his own plans for the future. Jesus would rebuke this Jezebel and send her to a sickbed along with those who commit adultery with her. He would also punish those who commit adultery with her. The reference to adultery is important. This passage makes reference to both physical and spiritual forms of adultery. When these Christians honored other gods in place of the Lord who had redeemed them, they were being unfaithful to their Savior. As a result of this, the metaphor of a sickbed is appropriate. They committed the sin of adultery. It is as if Jesus said, You love an unclean bed. Here, I will give you one and cast you into a sickbed. What exactly was the sickbed? It's possible that this is only a metaphor for suffering, or it could refer to an actual illness that Jesus permitted into the life of Jezebel and the others who followed her as chastisement. Because of passages in the Bible such as 1 Corinthians 11.30, we are aware that when God's people sin, he may punish them by causing them to become ill. We read, unless they repent of their deeds. Jesus explained the reasoning for this chastening. To begin, the goal was to convince them to seek forgiveness for their actions. Second, it was to serve as a model of holiness for other churches so that they may recognize that I am the one who searches the minds and hearts. The ancient people believed that the heart was the seat of intelligence. This warning was not only directed at her, but also at those who commit adultery with her. Christ was prepared to judge anyone who was complicit in the woman's immorality. If they did not repent, they would face great tribulation. We read, Hold fast what you have till I come. There were a great number of devout Christians who refused to compromise their beliefs in Thyatira. Jesus' only instruction to them was to hold fast. They must not stop doing what is good. They must avoid becoming sidetracked or disheartened by the mission that Jesus has given them to carry out. Jesus also instructed them on how long to hold fast, till I come. Up until Jesus returns, we have to maintain our steadfastness and our commitment to him. Only when it happens will the struggle be won. Not every Thyatira believer was immoral. Some were well aware of God's holy standards and refused to deviate from them. The message to those who did not participate in the immorality cult was to stand firm, hold fast till I come. The Promise of a Reward 
Revelation 2, 26 through 28. The one who overcomes and the one who keeps my deeds until the end, I will give him authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and the vessels of the potter are shattered, as I also have received authority from my Father, and will give him the morning star. Christians are able to triumph even in the face of the corrupting and idolatrous influence of Jezebel. We read, He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end. We must not let the immorality and idolatry that we see all around us, even among Christians, cause us to get overly disheartened. Through those who triumph against adversity, God's work will continue. We read, To him I will give power over the nations. Jesus made a promise to his followers that they would reign with him. Those who prevail over the threats posed by idolatry and immorality will be rewarded. To them, Jesus offered a share in his own kingdom. The word that is translated as rule literally means to shepherd. I will give him the morning star. He offered them the reward of himself as their compensation because he is the morning star. Revelation 22:16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you of these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. We read, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is a letter that should be read by everyone. It's about those who, like Jezebel, tempt others to sin through their actions. This letter is addressed to those who follow Jezebel's teachings and lead others to sin, as well as those who allow Jezebel to carry out her evil deeds. Ultimately, it's also a message for the faithful who must remain steadfast. All who choose to be faithful until the end will be victorious. They would rule the nations alongside Christ during the millennium, and they would be raptured to heaven with him the bright and morning star before the tribulation. The sex drive. The Bible is a library that covers a lot of issues. It's a book about God's creation of humanity and his ongoing relationship with us, which touches every aspect of our lives. It's a book about birth, growth, maturity, and death. A book about love, hatred, despair, and hope. A book about hunger, pain, pleasure, and ecstasy, and a book about desires. Desires should be used, but in its proper place and time according to God's plan. Within that plan, the sexual instinct is a good thing, a powerful source of life and unity between two beings. Outside of God's plan, it quickly becomes a means of division, a source of cruelty, perversion, and death. Walter Tropisch the Bible speaks honestly about the human lust drive. Indeed, it's more straightforward and honest in describing it than many so-called pleasure manuals published in recent years. Doesn't that sound familiar to you? A young man encounters a beautiful young woman and on the first impulse he says, I want her. It reminds me of the story of an old hermit and his son who lived far back in the mountains away from any other human being. The boy had never seen a person other than his father. Finally, the old hermit decided to bring the boy to town on his birthday to give him his first taste of civilization. Walking down the street, they passed a couple of pretty girls, and the boy said, What in the world are those? The old hermit was taken off guard. Er, uh, that's nothing, son, he said. It's just a couple of geese. The boy seemed to accept that explanation, so they went on. The pair spent a full day exploring the city and visiting the various shops. Some of the places where they stopped were the livery stables, the sawmill, and the blacksmith's shop. Finally, they decided to go home. But before they left, the old hermit said, Son, I would like to give you a birthday present. Have you seen anything here that you'd like to have? Sure, the boy said. I want a couple of geese. God intended for us to be attracted to one another. God gave each person an endowment of physical forces that enable him or her to live and grow. Psychologists call them drives. One is the drive for self-preservation, 
the compulsion to protect oneself, find food for oneself, and find shelter from bad weather. Another is the desire for religion, the way to fulfill one's awareness of the spiritual realm. Yet another strong drive, and perhaps the one that's most misunderstood, is the human desire for sex. This is the compulsion to seek and mate, to enjoy the physical pleasure and to produce offspring. Our modern world is full of conversations about desires. The entertainment media, the commercial advertising, and even the textbooks of our schools are brimming with them. Raucous voices chatter about sex nearly everywhere you go. It seems to be the preferred topic of conversation. Lust is a perfect example of the truth of this statement. We desperately need to seek God's purpose in this area of our lives. God's Word includes an amazing abundance of information. Nearly every book of the Bible mentions this feeling, either directly or indirectly. We're beginning this new series on what the Bible says about lust so that we can all operate in this area wonderfully. I encourage you to dig into the Word to learn more of what God says. But I hope you'll be enlightened and challenged by the studies in this video, just as I found new insights by preparing them. I believe they can help you find a happier, more meaningful life. If you'd like us to continue discussing this series, please put it in the comments section below. To learn more about this topic, watch this video.